All right, so as we get started talking about World War II, I want to set this up for you in a way that I think will help explain kind of the unique way uh, in which this war is going to be fought. We're going to talk about, as you can tell from our old friend Colonel Tavington, the rules of war. Uh, and so I want to talk first through a little bit of the actual written rules of war. Maybe you didn't even know that was a thing, but we want to talk about those. But also want to talk culturally about the differences between how the United States, uh, Great Britain, Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union, how those guys are going to approach just even the concept of war and the way that people are supposed uh, to fight. Uh, and so that's what we're going to take a look at. Uh, why do we even need rules? Well, one of the things that you see is in the late 1800s and early 1900s, as the world starts to industrialize, they're using a lot of that industrial might to get better at killing people. And so in order to lessen uh, that particular damage, in order to keep civilians out of the crossfire, there are a couple of different accords that these folks are going to sign on to uh, in order to keep uh, those types of things at a minimum. Uh, one of the things was also that we could, for the first time, really reach anywhere in the world with the technology and the weapons of war. With the long-distance planes uh, and aircraft carriers that are going to be an integral part of World War II, as we're going to see with Pearl Harbor, no place is safe. And so as the world starts to shrink, you're worried about... Uh, the egos of these guys like your your Mussolini's and your Hitler's. And so having a set of constraints, uh, if you could get those guys to agree and to stick to them, would be very, very important. Originally, these rules start out as uh, rules for land-based combat. But what we're going to see uh, is that they expand as navies, uh, become an essential part uh, of warfare, and then again as air forces start to become an essential part of combat. Uh, the first set are what are called the Geneva Conventions. Uh, Geneva uh, was a place where, where these guys met to sit down and to write out these rules. And the Geneva Conventions, there's a whole lot to them. just want to highlight a couple of little parts. Uh, one is the treatment of prisoners of war. So how do we treat those folks that we capture? You know, how much medical care do you give them? How, you know, where do you house them, feed them, uh, especially if you're on a side that's losing a war. Maybe you don't even have enough food for your own people. What do you do for, uh, can you put these people to work uh, to help you in certain places? Do those people have to work? And so there are all kinds of things that come up in the Geneva Conventions as, as far as POWs. Uh, one of my favorite old war movies, and there is a copy in the film library, now that'll come as a huge surprise, is one called Bridge Over River Kwai. And it's got a very young Sir Alec Guinness in it, who will later on go on to play Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars trilogy. Um, but he is playing a colonel uh, in the British military. Now, what the Geneva Convention said was if uh, a group were POWs, if you'd been captured, you could be put to work by the guys that captured you. But enlisted men were supposed to work, and the officers were supposed to be kind of supervisors. They were still supposed to stay in command. And there's a interesting dynamic between the Japanese uh, and the British in this movie. Um, I, I encourage you to go and, and to check it out, see, uh, see what's going on there. There's even an American that's thrown in, uh, and, and it does a nice job of showing these guys and their different attitudes about war. But... Um, how, how you're going to use POWs. Um, civilians being in the crossfire, right? Everything was supposed to be done to take care, not to put civilians in harm's way. Uh, so any kind of non-combatant, women, children, uh, older men and women, uh, anybody that's not fighting, what can we do to keep those folks safe? So some of these rules are in there for that. It also establishes uh, the Red Cross as a symbol uh, to be respected on the battlefield. So if you painted this red cross uh, on something, then that meant it was used for medical purposes. So if a building had this on, that was a hospital. Uh, if uh, a 
you know, a, a barrack or something had this on that was a place they were storing medicine or things like that. If somebody's wearing this on the battlefield, uh, that person's a medic, and so they weren't supposed to be uh, targeted uh, in a hostile manner. And so the idea was we want to, we know war, you know, people are going to get wounded, people are going to get killed, but you want to give people as much of a chance as you can, uh, and you want to... Um, not hurt the people who are trying to help everyone on the battlefield. Uh, also, you know, another part of this is, you know, if you got an enemy and they were wounded, uh, you're supposed to help them out too, right? You know, try and patch them up uh, as best you can. So there are an awful lot of these um, rules in the Geneva Conventions that that are being set out. Uh, the other one are what are called the Hague Conventions, uh, and the Hague Conventions were all about uh, tactics uh, and weapons the things that you could use uh, in warfare. Give you an example. One of them uh, in the original Hague Conventions is right around the turn of the century uh, was you, you couldn't use bullets that expanded uh, inside the human body. And so, you know, they've, they've got those kind of rounds and things today. Uh, but the idea was on the battlefield, if somebody gets shot, you don't want to make it to where they don't have a chance. Uh, they, these talked about different things you're supposed to use. Uh, one of the big ones was the idea of poison gas. And especially after World War I, kind of saying, okay, we're not going to do that uh, anymore. And so all of these things are meant to, as best they can, uh, almost civilize warfare. Keep it, as crazy as it sounds, as, as safe as possible uh, for these guys that are putting their lives on the line in combat. What we see uh, when we look at kind of the, the psychology of each set of people when they're fighting are some very different attitudes uh, about uh, a couple of very important topics, right? It, in the West, so we're talking uh, France, the United States, uh, Great Britain. So kind of what we consider those Western powers. Um, they, they all had something in common. Human life was the most valuable thing uh, that there was. And so you went out of your way, if you were from this culture, to protect human life. If you're a commander, you tried to protect the men who were underneath you. If you're uh, one of the leaders of the war, you didn't want to put your folks in uh, harm's way if you could avoid it. Honor was a lot about how you fought. If you remember going back again to the Patriot, just that idea of wanting to to meet on the battlefield, go toe to toe, not, not do kind of the sneaky uh, tactics uh, that were making the British so mad. It's the idea that the way you fought reflected on you and your character. Suicide in the West was looked at uh, as a sin. And so you wouldn't have sent men on suicide missions. You're going to see with a couple of the other cultures that suicide was a way of maintaining or restoring honor uh, after you'd messed up on the battlefield. That's not the case. Uh, for these Western powers, right? Again, it goes back to the value of human life, and that's the most important thing uh, that we've got. So throwing that gift away uh, obviously wouldn't set very well with those folks. Now let's contrast that with these Eastern powers. Uh, and so move just a little closer, go to, to Germany uh, and to the Soviet Union. And we're going to see with both of those groups that the value of human life is less, than what it would be in uh, those Western countries uh, like the United States and Great Britain. Soviet Union especially, the, they, they were behind technologically. Uh, they didn't have uh, the guns, the weapons, the transportation to really keep up with the other powers in World War II. What they did have were people. And they just had tons and tons of soldiers. And so a lot of the Allied deaths in the war are actually going to come from uh, these troops from the Soviet Union. And so the commanders a lot of times didn't treat uh, people with that life, with maybe the respect uh, that you'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll talk in, in when we do the war on the Eastern Front about uh, a movie called um, Enemy at the Gates. It's all about the Battle of Stalingrad. and does a nice job of uh, portraying just what these Soviet leaders think about the soldiers who are fighting for them. Honor was something that wasn't just a personal thing uh, to these folks. Uh, it was something that reflected on your entire family. And so if you didn't 
do what you're supposed to do on the battlefield, uh, then that was a reflection on your your family group. And so that shame carried over to your family. We see this and, and kind of combine it with our last point here with suicide in the story of a guy like um, the Desert Fox, Erwin Rommel. He's a German field marshal, and he gets uh, accused of trying to be involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. He's such a high-ranking official and, and so well-known in Germany, though, that instead of putting him on trial and, and giving that dishonor to his family, uh, they basically give him the choice of committing suicide and preserving uh, honor in that way. And so, like I said, it's a different attitude. Still, though, you've got uh, kind of some commonalities between these two groups. When we go to the Far East, though, and we start to look at the Japanese the Japanese are going to come to World War II with a completely different mindset. Though they had been trying to modernize their military, uh, a lot of the officers were still uh, attached to what was called the Bushido Code or the samurai tradition that had been passed down through, um, through Japanese history. And so for the Japanese, one of the things you didn't do was surrender. You fought to the death. And we'll see that as we look at some of these battles that are going to happen in the Pacific. Sometimes it was a choice between uh, just basically eliminating most of these Japanese troops because they weren't going to give up uh, once they'd started fighting. That was that was dishonorable. And so when you talk to, to guys that fought in the Pacific versus guys that fought in Europe, uh, the fighting a lot of times is more brutal. Uh, the the animosity that American troops felt towards uh, these Japanese troops uh, is sometimes intensified just because uh, of kind of this this attitude the Japanese troops were bringing to um, to, to the battlefield. Suicide in the samurai tradition was another way of preserving honor. It was very ritualistic uh, in the ways. Uh, that they did it. Uh, but towards the end of the war, we'll see them start to use things like kamikaze pilots, suicide bombers, uh, to come out uh, and to attack U.S. ships. And so we're going to have two big theaters of war. We're going to have the, the European theater and the Pacific theater. We have two different sets of guys that are fighting in each. And so the fighting is very different, not just because of the way the, the land looks uh, or the way these battlefields are going to set up, but also because of the, the psyche uh, of the enemies uh, that they're going to fight. And this isn't just a World War II thing. You can think about that when we go and fight uh, in other places. You know, we've been uh, involved in wars recently with Iraq and Afghanistan. And just one of the things we really try to do is understand and communicate to our troops now just really the psychological makeup, the cultural makeup of the, the countries they're going to uh, so that they understand uh, what they're up against, what it's going to take to help, how certain actions are going to be um, received. Uh, so there is your lesson, sir or ma'am, in the rules of war.